to click and just... Yeah, just these. Right, and perfect. Forwards. And this is the... Yeah. Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. It's so great to be here because many years ago I was an art student as well. Um, I was at Chelsea College of Art, actually. I did a foundation course there and I was always oriented towards being an artist, actually. I don't know how I ended up writing about finance. Um, so somewhere from there to here, I ended up realizing that I was actually very interested in how the, how the world worked. And I think that art, in many ways, is um, one of the ways we express what's going on in the world. And artists who are not very informed on what's going on in the world don't do good art. So um, people always want, ask me, how come you ended up doing all this stuff? But I think it's, it's, it's actually quite complimentary to be an artist and to be asking questions all the time. I was always very interested in propaganda and, and um, the sort of the power of the cult um, and cult uh, historical episodes from Augustus to the communist empire, etc. So tonight, I'm going to be, today, this afternoon, <clears throat> I'm going to be talking about the Uberization of the economy. It's something that I've ended up writing a lot about. And I ended up writing about this because about three, four years ago, I was part of what I would describe as a tech utopian uh, movement in, in, uh, in the world of finance journalism. We were writing a lot about this idea that actually, maybe things aren't so bad. If you cast your mind back to four years ago, five years ago, it was a really t like traumatic time in markets. Everybody thought the world was ending. Um, we were going to be living, you know, in caves, uh, dealing in, in gold bullion, looking after our our families with guns. And, you know, the Trump nightmare. Um, but um, I was part of this other team that was thinking, actually, maybe look, look around. Technology is everywhere. It's really improving our lives. And I bought into this idea that maybe we were actually on the road to a post-capitalistic abundance future. And this was just the sort of very complex transition. And that's one of the reasons we're having so many um, financial crises, etc. Because ultimately, once there's abundance, capital itself becomes totally undermined, right? Now, I'm here to tell you that I was really wrong. <laughs> I don't think that's the case at all. And so tonight's presentation is actually about the limits of what this post-capitalistic utopian dream we've been presented with, by a lot of it by Silicon Valley, and where I think its limitations lie. So I thought I'd start with some interaction first. How many of you love the sharing economy, or ha have heard of it, like it, are posit positively minded about it, think it's a really good idea. Hands up. And who, who's concerned about the sharing economy? And who's kind of agnostic, doesn't really know? Okay. It's good to know. Yeah. Um, who loves cheap taxis? Okay. <laughs> Who, but who thinks that actually the economy should be centered around personal transport on a one-to-one -one basis? Do we think that's the most efficient way to transport a lot of people around? Who thinks it is? Trains are more efficient, right? Who loves cheap accommodation, whether it's long-term, short-term, holiday rentals, hotels? Airbnb, right? We all love... How many of you have used Airbnb? Do, do any of you have anything bad to say about Airbnb? Yes. So that's one. <laughs> okay, so, so you're all big Airbnb fans. Okay, that's good. Who loves the idea of the gig economy? This is obviously the idea that in the future, you'll be able to be a jack of all trades. In the day, you'll be an Uber driver. You'll also make money from renting your spare room. You'll maybe do odd jobs on BizBuy. You'll be <coughs> selling your coding services elsewhere, doing some marketing jobs. You'll be, a, you know, literally no specialization. You won't, you won't have to be a doctor or a physician or a you'll be a kind of jack-of-all-trades. Who thinks that's a good economic structure? 
No one. Good. Right answer. <laughs> so that was leading on to this. Who, who wants to work in the sharing economy? Do any of you as students aspire to be part of the sharing economy? Okay. So that's the kind of conflict that we see with Uberization uh, in general. It's very nice. We're all, it's great when we're beneficiaries. It's, it's absolutely fantastic when we get free cheap taxis and cheap, cheap, cheap hotel rooms. Not so good when you're the worker who's having to provide those services, usually at the cost of your own security, at the cost of your own quality of life, and also at the cost of your, your general you know, stability and ability to forecast what you'll be doing in the next 24 hours. Now, of course, Karl Marx, how, how many of you are familiar with Karl, Karl Marx? I'm just going <laughs> to assess. I'm, be, I'm sorry for being really, <laughs> really um, insulting in that sense, but it's, I just like to get a good idea. Because actually, when I was an art student, I had no idea what I was doing, but I was not as advanced as you guys. I was only on a foundation course, and I can admit that I absolutely knew nothing about was I was totally narcissistic, only was interested in going to the union. It was terrible. Anyway, so Marx, um, Marx said this. I've kind of contracted it a bit, but basically in the ideal com communist society, you'll end up with this beautiful economic structure where you, as a member of the society, can do one thing today, another thing tomorrow. You can hunt in the morning, fish in the afternoon, rear cattle in the evening, criticize after dinner, just as I have a mind without ever becoming a hunter, fisherman, herdsman, or, or critic. Um, and this was this idea that you would be liberated. The economic structure would be so efficient, it would no longer have to, in any shape or form, anchor you to any particular pro like, profession you could do whatever your heart pleased because the economic structure was going to look after you. And this was a form of liberation, of course. How did, how did Marx envision that this liberation was going to occur? Well, the original sharing economy was communism. And it was predicated on the idea that a centrally planned economy with, say, a five-year plan could reasonably organize production, uh, education, healthcare, um, every little cog in the economic structure so that things would be perfectly efficient. Now Marx actually envisioned that um, communism would emerge from a capitalistic uh, crisis. That once capitalism got to the point where most of the production in society was there, i.e. all the factories had been built and everything we needed was there, um, it would naturally create such terrible inequality that the proletariat would rise up in the style of Occupy and grab the factors of production for themselves and this would be the revolutionary moment where the wealth of the nation would be shared amongst every single participant. Um, now, it never actually emerged that way. Communism took hold in mostly what were very unde un undeveloped countries like Russia, and it took a long time to even create those factors of production. So before they could have this abundant, beautiful realization of um, the Star Trek economy where you just have a replicator and it just creates whatever you want, they had to build it. So there was this constant propaganda in place justifying the hard work that you would have to do to finally emerge at the, uh, the beautiful, plentiful tomorrow, the utopian vision. And this could be achieved with economic planning, by a committee, no less. So here's, so, excuse me, I took these photos with my iPhone, so they're really bad quality, but they come from a collection of propaganda um, illustrations that I have. Here, you can come and have a look at them. I got these from my grandfather because I'm Polish, so my parents, my family, experienced communism very much, very directly. And um, I was always mindful of the propaganda 
because my mother, my father, made such a big point <coughs> about making me a contrarian because they wanted to ensure their children didn't <coughs> fall for the same um, sort of mentality of not questioning anything. So I was always taught to question. Maybe that's why I'm such, such an annoying journalist. Um, so anyway, so this was, this is, this is again, this is a propaganda campaign trying to justify the hard work that you need to do to get to that utopian vision in the end. But of course it didn't, work, it didn't end very well. There was a brief spell where it looked like the communist system was doing really, re really, really well, outpacing America in some cases. The growth was phenomenal, like in China. Um, but then suddenly something happened around the 70s, 80s. We saw that actually that economic bounty came at a cost. And it came at a cost of personal, at a cost of personal liberty. So if you lived in communist Poland or in communist Russia, suddenly you saw that even though you had access to all these plentiful goods and it was so great for you, you weren't necessarily as free as you thought you were. Your, your future was being decided by somebody else. Whether or not you, know, you would went to university, whether or not you would um, work in this factory or that, there were suddenly concessions that weren't really there before. And then something really strange happened. The, the bounty that was promised to society just didn't materialize. Shops were empty. Resources were lacking. Russia had a significant deficit, um, which it couldn't admit to, and which it disguised in some cases with some interesting economic statistics. My mother was actually a um, economic uh, student, and she always told me, because I used to be very proud of her economic achievements, and I used to tell everybody that my mother was an economist at a very famous Polish um, economic school, and she would be like, shh, don't tell them that, because um, we learnt a very different type of economics. We learnt how to fudge the statistics. So she would admit to me how they used to do that. But there are other costs. There are other costs. Because when you have free goods that come at a, without a significant understanding of the costs, something called the tragedy of the commons occurs. And this is this idea that when it's free, you abuse it. We know this now because of, say, email. Email, to me, is one of the most abused resources in the world if my spam box is anything to go by. I don't know how many of you get spam, but um, it is a, a very good example of tragedy of the commons. Here's this free resource, email, and it's being exploited by people to the point where it's clogging the bandwidth and um, we're having to spend real energy piping messages that are totally useless in society. This, of course, how many of you know what this is? Any idea? It's the Aral Sea. And the Aral Sea was, well, it was part, in the Soviet geography students, but it's a really great example of the tragedy of the commons. Here was this resource, this abundant lake, and it was tapped so heavily by uh, Soviet industry that over the years it dwindled and this is not only did it dwindle I mean it almost half I think that's a quarter of the size of what it was originally it was one of the most um, tragic economic uh, environmental crises of all time and you can see the color changing as well because a lot of it had um, terrible sort of chemicals put into it as well so um, this is the consequence of, this is, this is a very physical consequence of the tragedy of the commons, basically. Now, communism, I don't want you to think that I am here um, in some way being a libertarian or a right-winger, because that's not the case. I'm totally politically agnostic. I'm just here to talk about not going too far the wrong way. And... What I see with the Uberization of the economy is a lot of the same mistakes being repeated that were being repeated, uh, that, that were originally um, uh, done in, in the original uh, communist period. So back then, there was one brand for everything. So because the government, 
essentially planned for everything. You didn't need to have competition anywhere. You didn't have to have multiple taxi companies. There was only one, MPT in Poland. You didn't have to have multiple <coughs> travel companies. There was only one, Orbis. In po this, is the, the, this is a Polish example because I'm familiar with Poland. There was uh, no need for multiple shops. You just had one, Pevex. It was the, the everything store, you know? Who's, who's the famous everything store today? Amazon, of course. Um, um, and this is MHD, which is wrong way around, but again, another single brand for almost all distribution across the country. So why did it go wrong? What was, what was the reason why? How much time have I got? Okay. Uh, another 10 minutes? Okay, I'll keep going. So the, I've boiled it down to six points, and like economists would definitely disagree with me because I'm not an economist. But I put it down to fixed costs, subsidization, central planning by committee, bad incentives, and capital misallocation and bureaucracy. Now, I'm going to explain that, though, in a modern perspective. Um, rather than going through what happened in communism, I'm going to show you how, or try and explain how these issues are emerging today in the sharing economy. I'm going to tell you this story um, through the eyes of an Uber driver. So, back in communist times, fixed costs were completely ignored. Fix, what is a fixed cost? Well, in some cases, it's basically a living wage. It's this idea that we have to have a certain standard of living. And if you make sacrifices to people's standard of living, even if it's temporarily for the, for the sake of pursuing a, a noble goal like abundance or, you know, the cornucopia of plenty, um, it still leads to a sacrifice by somebody. In today's world, Uber drivers are making that sacrifice because their living wage is not usually enough to cover the, the sort of work they're doing. Now, the technologists will say, ah, but they're disrupting a cartel, black cab cartel or the mini cabs who have um, you know, claws into the local economy or whatever. But the truth is, yes, Maybe those black cab drivers do charge excessive rates, but the rates they charge are the rates you need to ensure a good lifestyle for, for even a taxi driver. Now, we in the West have a general perspective on what a standard of living should be. That is what the minimum wage is. Countries that don't respect that minimum standard of life and will <coughs> happily exploit their workers well, we've seen this happen in China for a very long time. So when we in the West were asking for basically a standard of living that was too high for the capitalists to make a profit or to keep disrupting each other, they'd kind of reached their, their, uh, the floor on how low they could go. They moved to a country such as China where goods could be manufactured at much lower standards of, of life because fundamentally, the Chinese were coming from a different surrounding environment. And for them, a move into a, uh, a sweatshop economy, uh, factory was an improvement on living in, an agricultural con in, a, in a little agricultural village, not knowing whether or not you would survive the winter because your crop didn't work. So other fixed costs, of course, include the stuff that the Uber drivers might not necessarily um, appreciate at the very beginning when, they, when, when they're thinking about whether or not to become an Uber driver. So it looks very tempting. You make, you know, a thousand pounds a week. But once you account for car rental, the costs of cleaning, insurance, your mobile contracts, you know, for, you know, they have to pay their own mobile contract, the, the cost of having to wait somewhere, whether it's parking, uh, petrol, and all sorts of other extras, when you talk to the Uber drivers, actually a lot of them tell you that they didn't appreciate, that they're not often, you know, sometimes they're only barely break even. And by break even, that's a concept of earning just enough to cover your costs. But of course, you should be earning more than that because that's the whole point of having a salary. There's no incentive to be an Uber driver if you are not taking home more than you're breaking, breaking even. So that's the exploitation factor. 
Subsidization. Well, in communist times, subsidization was a chronic problem. So the idea was you take from the rich, you give to the poor, the poor get stuff for free. In my own uh, historical experience, uh, for example, all sorts of utilities were free, um, water, gas, etc. And of course, what this created was a tragedy of the commons. We overused free resources. We didn't really think about the consequences. In the Uber economy, we see subsidization everywhere. We see it in Google. We see it, when I say Uber, it's, I actually mean on a very expanded basis, most of the technology uh, sector operates on a subsidization basis, which means the rich subsidize the poor. You all get free email. You all get free rides. But who funds those free rides? That's the question. And there's only three people currently funding those subsidies. The first ones we don't really mind. They're capital investors. And if they want to give their money for like, you know, investments in crazy unicorn, so-called unicorn. Have you heard about the unicorn phenomenon? <coughs> yes? No. no. Okay. So somebody dubbed all these new sharing economy uh, stocks um, and companies unicorns on the, on the basis they're really rare and you have to really be discerning about um, trying to spot them and figuring out who, figuring out who exactly will it be uh, who ends up being a unicorn because there can only ever be one and they all end up being monopolies or nothing. So you either, you either pick the right one and you get billions and billions, i.e. you become a Facebook investor or you become an investor in Google or you pick the wrong one and you end up an investor in MySpace and it's a disaster, right? So you have to pick your unicorns. <coughs> so, but we don't care. Like capital investors, if they want to give their money to potential unicorns that turn out not to be unicorns, I'm not too worried about that. But it's the other, the other sec sector of society that I do worry about, which is the drivers and the workers generally, because they are the ones who are funding your ability to get a cheap ride. And the same argument applies to all sorts of other ones. Now, the other issue is central planning by committee or algos. In communist times, all decisions were taken by a technocratic committee who was focused on matching supply and demand and figuring out exactly what was needed, where and how. And these were very much human decisions made in consensus um, kind of environments. But they didn't always work because Consensus never works. <laughs> it's, you know, rule by committee never, it appeals to the average um, person. It does not appeal to everybody. Now, we look at Uber's algorithms and we think, oh, they're pretty efficient. If I'm nearby, taxi comes to me. But what we don't see are the human decisions going on in the background. So a good example of the central planning in Uber is um, how they deal with airport pickups. There are so many Uber drivers now, someone has to make a decision about how to prioritize who gets a ride and who doesn't. And is that going to happen on the basis of first come, first serve, on the basis of whether or not you have the best rating? Is it going to happen because you're geographically um, local? These are decisions that Uber has to decide. And it also has to decide how to uh, regulate those drivers to ensure they don't flood local areas. So there are all sorts of bad incentives that come, al come along with this. If, if you end up getting a bad rating, you have every incentive to, um, to game the system. You might bribe your driver to give you five stars to improve your rating. You might, vice versa, he might bribe you. I mean, how many people have been asked after dining somewhere to give TripAdvisor, you know, give, give a good trip, trip advisor review with a free coffee or something? I have, I don't know, if, maybe it's just me. But there's all sorts of gaming going on with ratings. And of course, there's all sorts of other, and that, that Daily Mail story, I think, really typifi typifies the problems with some of these systems. You can't anticipate them all. And certainly, a central committee can't do that. I'm nearly finished. <laughs> so capital misallocation is, is another big problem. And that's basically this idea that 
you send the wrong signals to society about where society should be spending money. So at the moment, we have this perception that, oh, Uber is a great place to work. Everybody suddenly wants to be an Uber driver. And on one hand, you have people saying, well, this is great. It's creating jobs. People can be Uber drivers. But no one is asking, does the world really need that many Uber drivers? Could we be spending those resources <coughs> in a better and wiser way? Could we be maybe training these individuals to become doctors or health practitioners? I mean, here we are in a scenario where we, where we have a health, national health service in crisis, but we are gearing the economy to provide more Uber drivers. That doesn't really make sense. And also, one day there will be a bonfire of Toyota hybrids. I'm absolutely certain of it. It's just. That's another signal being sent to the economy. We must build more Toyota hybrids. Um, <clears throat> and the last one is bureaucracy. Because as this beast gets bigger and bigger, and these companies don't appreciate some of the um, unexpected events that come along, the legal documentation that comes along with it gets bigger and bigger. And then so does the bureaucracy tied to Uber. So Uber starts off as a very small, nimble company. But over time, as people defraud the system, as Uber drivers <coughs> demand rights, as all of these different social problems come into, into play, you need legions of legal um, specialists drafting terms and conditions. And you'll, you'll all be getting you know, updates every other day. Well, this is very much like in um, the Soviet system as well. And, um, and of course, where there's legal bureaucracy, there's always an incentive to dodge that bureaucracy. And that's how, you emerge, how the black market emerges. So you already see this. You use Airbnb as an informal introduction platform, but you do the deal off the platform. You're not wanting to go through the official, you know, through the official system because you can get a better deal off the platform. And it's very much the same idea. And then you get the fraud, the cyber fraud, um, and the predatory element that preys on the fact that the underlying econ economy isn't that, that, that well matched. And in that scenario, you have to um, resort to basically illicit or, or underhanded mechanisms to get what you need. And my last point is that as it becomes more and more difficult to match the economy, um, these co corporations, and the same was true of Soviet communist uh, committees, they have to know more and more about you. Because here they are trying to match demand and supply. It's not working. How can they plan this more effectively? They ask you what your plans are going to be for the next five years. You know, literally, we'll start off next, you know, what are you planning to do for the next month? They'll, they'll die. D data mine you. They'll try to get as much information from you as possible. And it's all in the name of planning, better planning. It makes sense, but it also infringes on your liberty because once you commit to, say, going on holiday to Greece next year and the system has accounted for that, it's very hard for you to change your mind. And if you change your mind, there's a cost to the economic order. So you end up trapped in the decisions that you made a year ago. And of course, the central committees would try to plan five years ahead. Um, and this trapped people. It meant that they couldn't move around. They couldn't move freely. And the same is happening today. But we see it with data intrusion and with um, a lot of these companies essentially demanding <coughs> the rights to your, well, to your aspirations, basically. Or, worse than that, they try to steer your aspirations in the way that suits their economic planning. So say there's too many, there's an overproduction of bananas by accident in some area of the economy. A central planner might, for example, create propaganda that tells you that banana smoothies are really the key thing for um, keeping cancer at bay. That's the sort of stuff we're talking about. It's all in the name of shifting you away from, from apples and over to bananas. Does that make sense? <laughs>
any case, it's all about surveillance. And this is where we end. <laughs> so my point is, not that we should not persevere with the sharing economy. The idea of a sharing economy is actually what we have already. The financialization of the economy is a sharing of the economy. Finance is economic sharing. But we have to be mindful of exploitation, and we have to be mindful of who is funding the sharing benefits that we're getting. And is it coming at a cost to our own quality of life and the quality of life of the workers? Anacyclosis is this idea of cyclical revolutions. And um, essentially it can be um, described in one sentence, which is what happened before will happen again. So I say, let's be very careful about what we're creating here. Let's make sure, having learnt from history what happened with GOSS Plan 1, we don't <coughs> recreate GOSS Plan 2. Let's ensure the system is one that moves <laughs> forward, right? So this is the reason I bring this up. I don't know how many of you watch Game of Thrones, but um, there's this idea that Daenerys wants to be the ideal ruler. She's this idealistic um, sovereign. And over time, it turns out that actually it's really hard to be uh, a sovereign who pleases everybody. She's, her hands are tied. She's morally you know, strong, and she has ethics. But she ends up doing some really horrible things, because that's the nature of economic planning. Sometimes you have to upset people to do something for the greater good. Now, you don't want to end up like Stalin. You certainly don't want to end up like Daenerys either. And the only way you can ensure that doesn't happen is realize that things are cyclical. And chances are we haven't created the perfect system. We've created another phase in the endless cycle that takes us from good to bad to good to bad. It's a counterbalancing of everything. So my conclusion is the sharing economy, it's not really a revolution. It's more of an evolution. And this is a cyclical scenario which will continue on. We will create systems that look plentiful. We will also exploit workers in the process. And they will kick back. And there will be revolutions. <clears throat> and they will self-correct. And this can be expected to go on and on and on. And that in and of itself is not a bad thing. I think as soon as we appreciate that there isn't a one sort of um, one cure for everything, a panacea, a global panacea for our social ills, we will be able to recognize that this is an evolution, not a revolution. I hope that made sense. <laughs> I've got three initial questions. Can I just see if anybody immediately has some questions? Because um, I want to know how long I should go on for. Um, no? Oh, there's one there. OK, let me just ask a couple, and then I'll, I'll come to you. All right, um, so the first thing is you, you mentioned um, it was a really, really nice um, introduction and outline of the problems that, that we're, we're kind of en we've already entered into. And it sort of seems like you're looking at how it's going to play out. Uh, and so the, there is some sense. I mean, the, there's a sort of fatalism in your anacyclosis logic, because it seems like it's going to go that way, and then we have to sort of reco correct. recover another moment. But it does seem to me that there's something about um, not just the supply moment, but also the demand moment and consumption, where it's possible to intervene on this on the side of consumption and maybe move away from the kind of logics that you're describing. But I want to come back to that uh, a little bit later. Um, but you, you kind of mentioned to me just before we started that you were recently at Davos reporting for Financial Times. Do people know about Davos? It's a kind of world leaders forum, big business people, Soros, blah, blah, blah all the others meet with um, uh, politicians. So it's a kind of uh, the, the, the super powerful in the world kind of gathering to discuss uh, where the world is and what will happen next and what are the kind of changes in the economies. And you were, just, you were saying that um, 
one of the main, they had four themes, I think, at Davos, and one of them was about uh, the economies of abund abundance that are coming up, which is where you started. Mm -hmm. But I was wondering if you could outline, at that sort of level, how what are called global leaders are seeing, uh, what they understand by economies of abundance, because that's, in a way, your, your, your argument sort of depends upon abundance as a, as a, as a uh, condition of the economy. Um, but obviously this is kind of becoming a systematic notion. And just, just to inform you that a number of discussions that we've been having here about post-capitalism from the left side sort of argue that as we enter um, a stage of uh, automation, um, uh, the, the kind of standard structures and sort of limits of uh, capitalist economies of supply and demand scarcity kind of drop away. Um, and so we, we can sort of generate new economic conditions and new social conditions which are called, being called post-capitalist. It's kind of weird to hear about that from the top, if you want, rather than from kind of a marginal left position. So I was wondering if you could just speak about how the, the, the hegemonic figures are kind of understanding abundance. Um, so yes, this year's theme at Davos was the fourth industrial revolution, and there was um, a very clear um, focus on this idea that robots will take over all our jobs and we'll end up, but that it was based around a very techno-utopian perspective um, coming from Silicon Valley, which is actually staunchly libertarian. It's very right wing. This idea believes in free markets. It's funny because just like, um, you know, I believe in cycles. I'm very much about how things come together. And when you look at <clears throat> the libertarians, they're actually, when, when they go far right enough, they kind of end up fusing with the left because they become almost like the, the very extreme leftist hippie radicals. Mm -hmm. So um, you, you converge in some ways um, in, this, in this area where um, both sides of the spectrum want to create a commons which is uh, totally um, empowering of the individual. Um, the, com the, the left side wants to ensure it's equitably distributed and the right side just wants to ensure everyone's liberty is protected. Um, the question, however, <laughs> let me answer it. Um, so there are two perspectives at the moment on the post-capitalist argument. One is this idea by, presented by the likes of Eric Brunjolfsson and, um, well, Mark Andreessen, you know, all the big tech gods, um, that even Ken, Ken, Ken Rogoff, the esteemed IM, former IMF economist, that we are approaching this moment of what Keynes, another famous economist, called the leisure society, where once robots do all the work, we as humans will be able to sit back and just enjoy ourselves. And then there's the counter-argument, which the likes of Martin Wolf, who's my colleague at the FT, very famous economist and economic thinker, um, and Robert Gordon, another economist um, in the US, who say this is actually not true. What's happening today is in no way <clears throat> comparable to the amazing uh, de development progress we had in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. And, he, and even before that, in the 1870s, like the original Industrial Revolution, he says, changed people's lives much more significantly than the iPhone ever has. And he, for example, says, as a, as a he always uses this as an example, and I, I quite like it, if you were to uh, ch have to choose between an iPhone or a toilet, which one would you choose? Does it have a toilet app on it? <laughs> Just a regular toilet. Okay. The idea of indoor plumbing. So, you know, personally, given that most people use their iPhone on a toilet quite a lot, I would, I think you have to have the toilet first. And so that's basically the idea. And they are the so-called techno-pessimists. And they would say to these, this idea of a leisure economy that this is total bunk because in reality, there is always going to be scarcity. And we may take away... The, um, uh, we, we might liberate ourselves from the burden of having to produce food or have to produce uh, shelter, etc. But you can't replace things like human care. You can't replace things like, um, you know, psychologists will always have a lot of people who will want to um, 
you know, seek their services because that's just the nature of psych a psychologist's job. Um, so we will always need psychologists, we will always need nurses. And even in the extreme scenario where we have robots who are so amazingly human-like that they can substitute those jobs. So this is this new idea that um, My Michael Osborne at, Os at Oxford Univers University is presenting this idea that <coughs> robots now are going to be able to do a lot of the cognitively um, sophisticated work. So, so not just basic manufacturing, but actually um, like intellectual jobs and empath empathetic jobs. Um, so he, he would say, well, actually, once a robot is so indistinguishable from a human, well, you end up kind of loving it because it becomes, it becomes your friend. And whether or not it has a conscious or not doesn't really matter because how many of you have watched Short Circuit? And if you've watched Short Circuit, you know that even though it looks nothing like a human, as soon as it, something starts to evoke the qualities of a human, you, you care for it. You can't help but love it. So it's kind of irrelevant whether or not the robots have consciousness or not. Uh, once we start caring for them, we won't want them to do those jobs and they'll become slaves. And when they become slaves, they too will have to be liberated. And when they have to be liberated, then the economic problem is not solved. So you end up with, with what in Battlestar Galactica is known as what has happened before will happen again <laughs> for anyone who watches Battlestar Galactica. Okay, that was a vote of confidence in your, in your paper great. against the, the, the more uh, uh, um, accelerationist discourses that we've been hearing. I think one just, I, there wasn't, it was kind of like, yay. All right, okay. <laughs> There's a question behind. Yeah, I, I, let, let me, let, so the question is how do we break the wheel uh, of, of this kind of, because uh, you know, in, in a way it's kind of you're forecasting, like the conditions are in place and uh, you're kind of forecasting a, a near future uh, based on this sort of sharing economy. But the, the question also mentioned precarity, which is one of the things I was going to ask around. Um, and uh, the, in a way the, the version of uh, what you've been describing that we're more familiar with in the art school system are notions of precarious labour, um, which which you know kind of have their have their um, theories and sort of ideas in economics, but we have them through a kind of uh, sort of Marxist Marxist hangover essentially, um, and it's kind of had a lot of traction in the art system because at the beginning when you're asking about the gig economy, I didn't see how many people put their hands up, but I'm guessing not very many, because I think most people are already in it as artists. Uh, and there's a sense, I think, in the art field in which um, it's it's kind of, in a way, it still it still has a, it still kind of conveys an avant-gardism, but not as regards aesthetic forms necessarily, or artworks, but in forms of labour. That for about 20 years, artists have been sort of uh, kind of advancing a kind of haphazard gig economy without securities, uh, full of exploitations within the art field as well as outside the art field in order to keep art going. So you see this through studio spaces, <coughs> you see this um, in, in a way through artists leading gentrification strategies by accident and then sort of uh, implemented as policy uh, through the kinds of work that people will do as artists in order to continue doing artists to afford the studios where the prices are going. So there's a sense in which the, the insecurities that you're speaking about with Uber in, in a very different way and with a very different sociological constituency 
have already been around in the art field and continue to be around and look like they will continue to be around for a long time. So I think the precarity argument um, has had, a, 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 which, which is generally taken as big structural changes, has taken a specific form through the arts. You're describing precarity through, in a way, a, a kind of um, uh, a kind of forceful implementation of a new type of work condition organized by the internet, essentially. Um, uh, so the question around precarity uh, is, well, yeah, how do we break this wheel of encroaching precarity? But I think it's got specific salience to, um, to us, essentially, here. Yeah. How, how do we break the wheel? If I knew the answer to that, I would probably be Mark Zuckerberg or someone like that. Um, I don't, I am actually, you know, I said I, I studied ancient, um, I studied art, but I also studied ancient history. <laughs> and um, that's why I love Game of Thrones. I find it very point, pertinent on that front because it, it, it kind of, um, beautifully illustrate some of the key issues about civilization and how civilization emerges from certain factors which are based on cooperation really and um, cooperation is at the heart of what I would call civilization and um, sadly what we're ha what's happening now is that we are being encouraged through the internet economy to be uncooperative weirdly enough because we are being encouraged not to trust anybody. We're, you know, the, 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 um, we didn't really talk about it, but Bitcoin is a very good example of a paranoid generation who um, don't want to trust anybody because they've been let down too much by government, by local authorities, by whoever, and they want something that's completely devoid of trust. And of course, the reality is that civilization cannot exist without trust. Because everywhere you look, there is trust. From the person who made this bottle, I have to trust that they didn't put some sort of toxin in it. You have to trust that, you know, the food you eat tonight is probably manufactured with thousands of different people's input. Um, that it doesn't have horse meat. I mean, when you go on a bus, you have to trust the driver. You have to trust somebody. Now, as we outsource all that trust to an algorithm, who are we actually transferring that trust to? There's this idea of cybernetics, that everything is self-correcting, and these algorithms will, will determine by themselves what's right and what's wrong. But really, I don't think that's the case at all. That's my personal perception, is that someone is programming those algorithms. Somebody's making a decision um, about whether the self-driving car should hit the young mother with the child or whether it should run into the granny across the street. And those decisions are centralised. <laughs> you know, oh. in, 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 I mean, the, the, it comes down, it comes down the to granny. that sort of... Right. She's, well, almost, she's almost out anyway. Well, t it depends, it depends. Maybe the granny is a, some sort of, you know, very intellectual uh, scientist who, who's needed for the future of uh, discovering some sort of, uh, you know, perpetual motion machine. I don't know. So it really, really depends. There are qualitative judgments to be made about everyone because we're not commodities, we're individuals. And we, as individuals, make these assessments day in, day out as we meet people. Algorithms can't do that. And even if we had very sophisticated algorithms, then they too would become indistinguishable from humans and they too would then need their own sort of personalities and their own liberties and their own, um, you know, when drones become self-aware, there are issues. And, and who's to say, so regarding the precariat, um, <clears throat> my last point really, because I really do know I go on a lot, um, is that the precariat um, is probably my biggest concern about the sharing economy. I think... As an artist, I like a former artist, <laughs> I totally understand how this generation is, is, is in many ways um, subjected to a, a huge uncertainty in their lives because they don't know where the next income is going to come from. Um, and I would stress that this is, again, a really important um, side effect of the technocratic nightmare that we're <laughs> constructing because to a techno... Um, technocratic mind, an artist is a luxury. 
We don't need an artist is an inefficiency in the system. Who needs art? <laughs> it's, you know, from a communist perspective, it's a total waste of time. Um, so what they did back then was that they commissioned state artists. Art, art became manufactured. It was completely, you know, art is about the creative element, that stuff that you can't predict. And in an economy that has to predict everything, art is a terrible inconvenience. It's the artists who are suppressed. It's the free thinkers who are always suppressed. And that's because they're the anomaly in the system that can't be controlled. They are a luxury in that sense. And um, how many of you, my last point, I promise, how many of you have heard of just-in-time manufacturing? Yeah. So just-in-time is based on this idea that everything works efficiently and we have as little idle capacity in the system as possible. Every apple that, is, that goes to waste is um, a miscarriage of... of, of justice in terms of just in time because it's an apple that should not have been produced in the first place. Um, so artists, journalists, bankers, terrible, terrible luxury they are. Um, we're all luxuries, but even sportsmen, movies, or, I mean, mo perhaps advertising movies, maybe they serve a purpose if they can brainwash the public. But other than that, I think anyone who doesn't toe the line is, is, and is unpredictable is a luxury for the system. Does that make sense? Just, just to go back to the, the question uh, comes back to the point. I, I think it's the how, how to break the wheel. Sorry, let me just mm -hmm. I think the how to break the wheel question, uh, again, you, you kind of move to the, to the large scale logic of the thing. Mm. But, but the models you're describing here seem to me somewhat different to the Soviet model, because in the Soviet system, um, there was no competition whatsoever. There's no available competition, and there are no alternatives because it was state controlled. Whereas the mechanisms you're describing happen within some kind of market mechanism, even if it's a minor. So I think the question was around, uh, can, uh, if, if I can sort of. Paraphrase. Do you want to come back? So the, the, what I meant is that you are talking from the perspective of luxury, and I Yeah, what's, what's available now? And yeah. so for me, the, 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 the way I'd, I'd ask it through, uh, through, through the example you gave of Uber or Amazon and the rest of it is essentially these are consumption. Uh, we, we consume them. That's, how, that's, why they kind of take, that's why they become monopolies, because they lower the price. Right? Mm -hmm. So is there anything we can do in terms of consumption patterns or consumption demands that could maybe kind of intervene within this kind of uh, you know, automaticity? <coughs> Uh, absolutely, absolutely. Which is why subsidisation is one of the biggest evils in this picture, because it's through subsidisation. You know, they say tax can solve almost anything, and it's true. If you make something expensive, people won't use it. So taxing sugar or whatever, people won't use it. So for us, we are now misusing sugar because it's so cheap, it's so, it's so abundant, we're all over consuming it. If it was more expensive, we wouldn't. Now... The flip side of that is taxis are cheap. If they're subsidized, we will consume them. We have to be extremely strong-willed to do the moral thing rather than the easy and convenient thing. And this is one of the problems, I think, with technology is that we roll things out without necessarily thinking about the consequences. It's not like with drugs, and by drugs I mean pharmaceutical drugs, <laughs> which have to be you know, very scrupulously tested for years before they are released to the public. We, you know, lots and lots of consequences are considered. With technology, there is no testing. So we roll out systems, it's not just technology, it's all these apps and business models. We roll them out and then we consider only later if they're a problem. Jean Tirole is the Nobel um, economist, a winning economist, who specializes in something called two-sided markets. And this is this idea that if you are getting something free, you're probably the product, right? Do you know, you've probably seen the cartoon of the little pigs going, oh, you know, it's nice to have all this nice food. <laughs> Actually, we're the product. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so 
that's the issue. So you say from a consumption point of view, it's very hard to regulate your consumption when someone is telling you, oh, this, this resource is free, go for it, use it, it's plentiful. When we see this with climate, climate problems today, we, we abuse the resources we had because they were free and plentiful and we thought there was no consequence. But in reality, physics says that for every action there is an equal and opposite reaction. I'm not a physicist, I wouldn't even try to pretend to be a physicist, but I do think we don't necessarily see the costs of the stuff that we initially think is free without any cost. And as to how to break the wheel, I think breaking the wheel is about bringing back competition. So it's about unbundling these massive monopolies. So it's about antitrust. It's about breaking down Uber and making sure they're not the single only operator of taxis in the system. Okay. Um, I mean, it seems to me one, one option is just to pay more for things. <coughs> so instead of going for the cheap thing like Uber, you pay, you pay a full price. Uh, and if you can't, then you take a sacrifice. That would be... That's, the, the, that's a noble... I mean, that's, a, that's, a, that's easy for, a, for someone to say <laughs> if they have resources at hand. But if you're struggling, you will... Sorry. I, I, think, it's, I think it makes logical sense. You pay for stuff. You have to pay for artisan loaf or whatever instead of the bog standard Tesco loaf. But the truth is that um, that's a very, you know, to ask that of people who have very little is, is, a, is a big ask. Yeah, okay, so there's one, two, and then three. So I'll, I'll take them in turn, because I think we have some time. What's interesting in yeah. your um, concept of um, outside process, um, because the, the idea is obviously that everything that goes around comes back around and so um, if, you, if you look at the theories of Congratia, Congratia will, will say that, that we, you know, um, it'll be like a 70 year cycle, we'll go through, through, through an, an upsurge of a, of a new technology, it will peak, it will go, come back down again, there will be a new te technology which will replace it and so on. In this situation, I'm, I'm not seeing another technology come along which is replacing the, 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 the previous, previous paradigm, and, and what we seem to be replaced with is a, few, a, a sort of notion of, of a, a future which is, isn't really. Um, well formed or has any great, great basis to it whatsoever, this is the gig economy and so on. We're basically, basically forming a, 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 a future which is based on, on precarity for the, for the many and, and great wealth for, 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 the, for the very few. That doesn't seem to be a way for the future whatsoever. Do you have any sort of views of how this, this may play out or where it's going to and so on? Uh, okay, so the question was a, was a comparison between the theory of anacyclosis that Isabella was presenting and another theory of um, long-term long -term cycles within economies called Kondratiev waves, which kind of has 70-year cycles of uh, a, a new technology emerges or a new social system emerges, which produces great wealth because it's reorganizing and it's consumption and so on and so forth of new objects. I think that computers in the last 20, 30, 40 years maybe. Um, and then that, that cycle of consumption kind of declines as we reach saturation points and then a new one comes along. So a one part of the question was about um, the comparison between the Kondratiev wave and anacyclosis. And the second part of the question was in the Kondratiev wave, the, the wave um, emerges and then sort of uh, breaks, uh, essentially because of new technologies, which are kind of new social mechanisms, the new social systems. So there's a sense of futurity within the Kondratiev wave model. Um, and so the question is whether there was, because, because what you're presenting through the precarity, uberization of the economy looks pretty bleak. And it doesn't look as it, as it has any sort of um, uh, future vision to it, because it's all short-termism, essentially. Uh, whether, whether there was, a, how, how it will play out, and whether there's some sense of futurity or uh, future construction in, in the model that you're describing. Um, so anisoclosis is actually a theory um, by the ancient Greek historian Polybius. Um, and he was a contemporary of the Gracchi. I don't know if you have heard of the Gracchi, but they were ancient Roman reformers who were the equivalents, I would say, of Occupy today. They were, they were fighting for, for the rights of the average plebs in, in, in ancient Rome and trying to re-establish property rights for them, having, having concerns about gross Roman inequality. So he was able to look at history from that perspective, and he saw a lot of 
cycles repeating from his, you know, going back all the way to ancient Greek times. Now, he didn't have the benefit or the luxury to, to have all the cycles that we do, but I think if he did, he would probably be in tune with the Kondratiev concept. I think the two theories are quite um, complementary. Um, but the difference is that Polybius's theory is much more political. It is not about technology as much as about political organization. And when you look at these current technologies, I would say they're actually fairly political. They're not technological in the sense that a washing machine is technological, or the invention of, say, paper, or the invention of um, a car. These are quite independent in inventions, which if I have a car, it's my car, I can use it <laughs> once it's invented. I have the knowledge maybe to create a new car. Maybe I need cooperation to create that car, but generally the product serves me. Whereas today's technologies are actually what the technologists like to call ecosystem-based. So they're two-way um, feed feedback loop systems where you, um, to get the benefits of the technology, you have to contribute to the technology as well. So hence, I don't know how many, many of you are familiar with Jaron Lanier and his idea about who owns, who owns the future. Um, I loved his book, I think it's brilliant. And it's this idea that essentially we, we are all working for Google, we just don't realize it. Um, because Google would be nothing without our contributions to it. And yet Google be is the sole beneficiary of our work. You know, we, we have perhaps the, um, you know, and from their perspective, we get the product and, and that's, that's good enough. But in reality, those amazing profits that Google makes are on the back of our, our contributions. So is it fair for them to be the only... Um, I mean, it's political in the sense that Uber, Google, all these guys end up being monopolies. And the government is essentially a monopoly. But it's a monopoly that redistributes the wealth. So it has the power to grab the wealth, like Google, but the government, unlike Google, has an executive which is controlled by the people, or supposedly controlled by the people, <laughs> and we have a say on how that redistribution of wealth occurs. With Google, the executive, Eric Schmidt, Larry Page, they decide how to redistribute those profits. So they say, we're gonna invest in self-driving cars, because we know better for all of you what you sh we should be spending the money on. We don't think we should be spending it on NHS or blah, 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 or you know, education. We want to spend it on self-driving cars. That's a terrible luxury. It's quite tyrannical in many ways. So that's the only difference. And I think Kondratiev may have also come to a stumbling block here because really, I'm like, I, I, everyone keeps telling me, asking me about the future. But I don't know, I can't, I can't see a new wave because I'm quite, I'm quite worried about, you know, that's where Robert Gordon comes in. He doesn't see, we've kind of reached the peak of optimum organization and whether or not we can proceed further without necessarily becoming a surf or medieval surf structure is very, um, I, I'm not sure we can. I, I'm sorry to be so bleak. <laughs> oh, it's nothing compared to what we've had. Um, there's, uh, there's, there were three, there's three more, and I'll come back to, to you in a minute. Um, there are theories of neo-medievalism since about the 1990s about kind of collapsing nation-state form. So there's, uh, let, me just take, let me just take the next three questions in a row. So there's one there, one here. There's one here, and then here. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, hi. Um I was just intrigued, uh, and maybe I'm asking to expand a bit, on the comparison you're making between the sort of centralized five-year plan, which, um, to my understanding, which is like almost zero, uh, sort of forced factories, yeah, so four years later, they don't need any more timber planks because they've got to make it because it's in the five-year plan, right? So, but the factory worker still has a job. He goes to work every day making these useless plants. Then, if you're, making, if you're making the comparison to um, behavioral predictions and, uh, and how that's sticking into sticking uh, another, a very a radically inverted um, kind of organization into a five year plan, maybe you could just. That's an interesting. I think it's, it's something. Could you just do the last bit again? 
Yeah, I, I heard. So, so how um, the behavioural side? Because I can see how there's a conflict in this, in that sense. Because that should make it more nimble and more uh, just like more re reflexive, more flexible. Can I, can I just just, Sorry. just 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 to rehearse the question. Um, so the the question is about the contrast between the five year Goss Plan 1.0 model, where even if even if uh, it was a crappily organised, the kind of like wrong headed in its planning, at the end of the five years, the factory workers still have work, uh, and they would continue going to work and get their money and so on and so forth to spend in the, the one shop in the, in the town. Um, so there's a kind of top-down managerial planning, whereas the model for the sharing economy is based upon sort of behavioral predictions. Essentially, so it's a different kind of mechanism for, so it's a question about the, the term of comparison between the two models. So the question also pertains to misallocation of capital because in Goss Plan 1, you had as per your worker who works away on stuff that nobody wants anymore and it's terrible waste. Um, and this is where I see the sort of, um, the paradox of the current system is that the techies, I think, think they've solved this problem by making it behavioral. But in reality, I don't think they have because the issue with Goss Plan 1 was that the factors of production, manufacturing, um, all the manufacturing uh, zones and fa you know, production facilities could not keep up with the um, crazy sentiments of the population who were changing their um, likes and dislikes every minute, right? And so there's always a discrepancy. Um, and the truth is the same occurs with the Uber economy. Um, it's just that Uber doesn't have to be um, carrying, Uber doesn't have to um, suffer the cost of that misallocation. Because of its clever model in which it's outsourced the burden of capital to the, to the drivers, so Uber doesn't own any taxis. All that capital investment is done by the precarious worker who is not only having to contract his um, car, like whether he buys it or contracts it, he, he's responsible for it. So when behaviours change and there's too many cars in the economy versus the amount of people who need a ride at that particular moment, guess who has to cover that cost? It's the driver. So the problem doesn't go away. Uber is just cleverly obfuscated who suffers the consequences of it. So in the, ca in the you know, purely centralised model, you could see the cost because the government had to bear the cost of idle factories, um, which they'd overinvested in. In the Uber or Airbnb model, if people suddenly stop going to Las Vegas and all these people who have invested in Airbnb properties, well, Airbnb doesn't care. It's not their, it's not their um, uh, responsibility. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, and I think you made some point about, um, about the consumer being stuck into a five-year plan through, um, I, I, right, so in a bid to avoid that misallocation, because every, every bit of misallocation is a waste on, is a drag on the economy. And this pertains not so much maybe to Uber, but it will do. I'm sure they will come up with this eventually. But it, it's sourced really from Amazon and from the big retailers and people like Tesco, who are you know, doing everything they can to gather your data about your consumption patterns and encouraging you to shop online. And if you shop online regularly, you can have regular baskets. So they know, for example, that every Friday, Mrs. Jones buys five cartons of apple juice, you know, six sausages, five, you know, whatever. They know, they have a very good idea that this pattern of behavior is going to happen every week. And they might, like banks, incentivize you to discounts. So say if you lock in to a, to a bus, you know, a regular shop that's, you know, like this for six months, we'll give you a discount on apples. So all this is about creating forward commitments, which then can be anticipated. And whereas Airbnb and Uber haven't yet figured this out, it will come because the next phase is the only way they can compete now is if they say people who, well, you can see it with like uh, Uber Pool and all these new models coming in, but they will, I guarantee you, at some point say, if you can commit every Friday you do this um, journey to work, you'll get a discount. It sounds like, that sounds like a solution. 
No, no, it isn't, because once, you know, in financial terms, if you're locked in, you ruin your optionality. And what is optionality? Optiona well, optionality isn't a word. It's a terrible financial jargon to, to begin with, so I hate using it, and I, I have to punish myself afterwards for having used it. But, but, no, because my, my FT editors hate it, and I completely agree with them, but you end up using it. But it's, it's basically the idea of options. People get stuff at a cheaper rate if they limit their options. It has always been the case. A rich man is rich because he has endless options. A rich man can, at the end of the day, at a flick of you know, his fingers, get a golf stream and go anywhere in the world. You know? um, he has endless options. The poor person has no options. So yes, it might solve the plan, but it comes at the cost of your, your op optionality. <laughs> We, we won't tell your editors. There was a... Okay, there's one question here. Yeah, um, I was recently reading about um, kind of future uh, prediction of how the uh, these monopolies would potentially work together um, by having a kind of platform that um, had, like, your Uber rating would, for example, communicate with your bank rating or credit rating or something like that, and how Okay, so, yeah, so the question was, um, for, for all, uh, a lot of this economy depends upon ratings and feedback and so on and so forth, and uh, the, the, the suggestion that the, uh, the different ratings in these different areas kind of get, um, yeah, they, they kind of start connecting to one another, so there's an overall, something like a credit profile, uh, but through a kind of rating mechanism through different, different uh, moments of consumption. It's a really good question, and yes, it is happening, and in many ways, um, it is anti-psychosis, because we've been here before. Banks are the original raters of society. Like, who determined your credit? Using a credit, credere is, you know, the Latin, it's, it's, it's to trust, and it's um, always been a factor of the sharing economy, because banks were the original sharing economy platforms. They took money from the rich, and they redistributed it to people who they deemed were worthy of it. Um, but it's this interoperability of ratings creates synergies that are necessary for, for so-called frictionless contracts, right? So banks used to specialise in sectors. There used to be agricultural banks. There used to be merchant banks. There used to be all these different specialist banks. And to keep um, competing and to keep getting... Um, additional profits, they had to eventually forge a cartel between all these different institutions where they shared each other's, um, you know, information about this guy. So if you did, if you were a farmer and you upset your agricultural bank, back in the day, you could still get a loan for uh, uh, something else completely. There was no, no information sharing. But then they started information sharing. Now, this is actually very Darwinian. If you've read The Selfish Gene or have studied any Richard Dawkins, um, you'll know that these are, these are perfectly rational Darwinian strategies for overcoming predators and people who cheat the system. Um, information, information sharing is a dove strategy deployed to help the weak combat the predators. Um, and that's exactly what the sharing economy is doing. And I see it happening with banks. They're working, you know, I'm actually in, um, in discussions with a, with a company who's desperate for me to write about them, who wants banks to be the kind of identity authenticators on the internet. So at the moment we use Google or Facebook to gain access to different things so we don't have to log in. And this guy is saying, well, why do we trust Facebook or Google? Like, why? Their information is often really bad because they don't meet anyone, they have no, no real information about the people. We should have banks doing this job. So imagine, you know, this is really where it's going. So in like five years' time, you'll be signing into all your social media with your NatWest account, not with not with your Facebook account, right? <laughs> now that seems very logical for the, for the social Darwinian, 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 
Darwinianists. Um, but the problem is social profiling and the fact that it's really hard and nightmarish to live in a total meritocracy where you have to worry about your rating all the time. Um, this is a nightmare. Like, Star Trek is the archetypal meritocracy, right? <laughs> it's this idealized world where Captain Kirk and his crew travel the world. But you only ever see Captain Kirk. They're the pinnacle of the meritocracy. And you never see what's happened to everybody else. And their ratings, essentially, <laughs> you know, how this connects to ratings is that the people who do really well in the rating society will, will be like Captain Kirk. But everyone else, as soon as you're blacklisted, well, that's like the worst profiling that you can possibly ever imagine. And imagine a world where half of the population is blacklisted because they're not worthy enough to be given access to this or that. Well, that, that for me, is a big problem because data never forgets, whereas we have in banking... We have created institutions purposefully to ensure that after a certain amount of time, your records are deleted. You do have a limit on how much banks remember about you because we understand, it's like with prisoners, we understand that people reform and they change. The, um, the tech companies don't have that, not yet anyway. We need, I think, a social movement to ensure that the tech companies do start deleting data. Okay, I'm going to take the next three questions, um, sort of all together, because uh, we're running out of time. Sure. So, and there's this meeting after. Do you have a question as well? Yeah, okay, Chris. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, just following on from what you said earlier, a lot of these uh, companies are trying to get operating systems that are closed nationally, is it not really trying to say it? And in terms of agency, you know, it's not really trying to say it. And in terms of agency, are they sort of reverting to why British or sort of a national? Okay, um, and then, yeah. Um, yeah, I wonder um, why you think about Uber as a shared economy and I, how you could make a difference because uh, I think you bring that into another example of shared economy, uh, like, are uh, quite positive, and by talking about Uber as a shared economy, and it's a debate that it's a shared economy. And I, I wonder how you would like kind of differentiate it from like Blablacar, where the person owns the cars and that is actually going from A to B and then they share the costs. So by on using that term we kind of underline all the practice that are positive. Okay. And then yeah. Yeah. Well I, I wonder what happened if in the event that this uh, then Silicon Valley companies, the three companies we're talking about, would would go this uh, would implement this uh, thing <coughs> universal basic income thing as a way of, you know, sharing what they're getting <coughs> from society, sharing it with society, <coughs> which I read is like a thought, like something that would probably happen. If this would happen, then then how this, I mean, I feel like these categories we talk about, like capitalism, socialism, communism, now what would be the role of, of government? There would be an in, there would be any government. All right, so it's all the small questions at the end. Um, <laughs> so the, the first question was that the, the kind of um, corporations and the sort of mechanisms you're describing are transnational, uh, transnationally organized, or at least they're, they're replicable from one jurisdiction to another. So if we're, if we're trying to think about forms of agency that can contend with them, um, what, what sort of agency do we have to think of? Because at the moment, for example, the citizen is, I mean, to just elaborate a little bit, the citizen is a kind of an actor of the nation state and therefore inadequate to, to what, what transnational corporations are doing. So we know that in other political formats through, say, the World Trade Organization process in the early 2000s and so on. So it's, a, it's about the, the scale of the, these kind of corporate actors um, and the mechanisms they're using for the shared economy against forms of agency that we might turn to spontaneously. Um, it sort of feeds, I think, into the second question, which was when you call this kind of stuff the shared economy, it, it overlooks or um, eclipses or shadows other forms of shared economy which might be more collaborative, mm -hmm. uh, which aren't privatized or corporatized, but are about um, 
a, I don't know, a collaborative form of sharing. Um, and then the third question was, um, uh, what happens to government? <laughs> because uh, with the, the, there's, there's uh, Nick Zernicek was here last week saying, um, saying that this, he's, he's a strong advocate of universal basic income. Uh, and recently, maybe through Davos actually, there's, there's discussion from Silicon Valley uh, for an interest in universal basic income. Um, UBI goes to the right and to the left as a way of replacing the welfare state, but also as a kind of, um, as, a, as, a, as a base essentially, like a, you can use my paper. It's, a, it's fine, let me share. It's fine. No, it's mine. I have a terrible goldfish memory, so I have to um, <laughs> so, them. So, um, what, what would be the consequences of UBI in terms of uh, the, 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 the cycle that you're describing? So it's basically forms of agency. Um, what do we mean by sharing in terms of these economies? And then what are the consequences of UBI? I'm going to deal with um, all really great questions, by the way. Um, I'm going to deal with the, the label question first. I, I totally agree. Uber is not the sharing economy. It's a terrible misnomer. It's all about the marketing. It, you know, there was a sharing economy movement. Um, I was very much part of it in terms of writing about it when it was first emerging. I mean, it's been going on for ages. I mean, collectives have been around forever, right? Mutual funds have been around forever. Mutual, um, uh, you know, even even um, your uh, building societies are essentially sharing economy structures, like real ones. Um, so none of that is new. And uh, certainly, I think it's a terrible misnomer. And um, why is it the case? Because the real sharing economy models don't scale very well. They have scaling like constraints and limitations. We're seeing this with peer-to-peer -peer lending at the moment. Peer-to-peer <coughs> -to, -peer to scale has to be has to become more and more like the conventional banking sector. Um, and the same applies to most collectives. They work on a regional basis where trust can be intermediated or in very close-knit societies. Um, so that's Roughly, I, I hope I can. I hope I've explained it, but I certainly think it's a it's a matter of opportunism, um, with with these guys using the sharing economy label to to brand themselves like this and to be part of something edgy and cool. And but they're not. I like, completely. They're actually more like rentier structures because they. Um, and by that I mean Uber takes all the profits <laughs> and it does yeah. none of the work. Um, it's not sharing anything. It's actually a very conventional capitalistic structure. Um, as to your point about uh, international jurisdiction issues, um, absolutely, these are massive behemoths. And in some ways, you know, I've, I've, I've compared Uber in the past to um, the British Empire. <laughs> it's a... Um, the British Empire was very similar in that the government didn't take risk directly. It outsourced a lot of the prospecting to private companies and individuals who went off to um, wherever to go and seek profits. And if they made profits, then you know the British system would, would take its share. Um, but if they didn't, they didn't have any of the risk. So all these adventurers would go around and, and fail, and, and nobody was any worse for it in, in the UK. And this is very much what's happening with a lot of these models, and it's been going on for many, many decades. I think the so-called American techno structure has been replaced by an international techno structure, which models a sort of very, um, it echoes a very paternalistic structure where the Silicon Valley guys say, oh, we know what's good for the rest of the world. We're going to go and spread our wings wherever. And we've seen this very recently, this, this controversy come up with Mark Zuckerberg in India with the whole um, basic Facebook basics idea and, and whether or not um, it's a fair proposition to the local um, economy. Um, should, they sh should they have an inferior product just for access? And I think that's very similar. I mean, there are so many echoes of neocolonialism there. It's just quite extraordinary. Mark Andreessen, who's a big investor in, in Facebook, got an, into a lot of water, hot water recently because he accused India in, um, well, the Indians basically said they're not, well, the Indian authorities have, have banned Facebook from providing this subsidized Facebook branded internet access service. And Mark Andreessen said, well, you know, if the Indians weren't so anti-colonialist, 
they would have got much further. <laughs> it was like the worst. It was such a shocking thing. I mean, he got derided en endlessly on the internet. He hasn't been back, I think. That, good, good, lucky him. Um, the, the, but the point, the point was just to, just to uh -huh. return to this. I mean, so, um, so the Facebook basics thing is basically they would provide the infrastructure mm -hmm. for internet across India. Uh, as long as people were were locked into the Facebook basic mechanism, yeah. uh, and they wouldn't have, they wouldn't be charged for that. So essentially, it's free internet as long as you do use Facebook and only Facebook. Right, exactly. So, so it's an inferior, it's an inferior mm -hmm. access. It's like a branded access into the internet, which is subsidised by Facebook, the corporation, in so much as they provide the in, in, internet. But the Indians, I think, are quite right to want neutrality. Why should they have to have an inferior version of the internet? Um, because if you're gonna, you know, they've been they've been in that position before, and I think they quite rightly want to have fair access or none at all. But the, to, just to come back to, to the question, which might feed into the question about uh, governments and states, mm -hmm. um, I think the question was around well, with with, with imperialism, um, you can you can construct a counter movement to it on the basis of nationalism, right? So like the the, the anti the decolonization movements are. Nationalist movements against external control. Um, it's it's hard to envisage that model, but that model just doesn't work now in terms of these large-scale transnational actors. So I think the question is about the form of agency that could contend with with something on a. In a way, we can't appeal to the same the same grounding structures to oppose these kinds of. Mechanisms. There isn't a there there isn't an overarching authority that has jurisdiction over these over these in, you know international, um, multinational corporations. So um, do we want to have a world government with authority over these sorts of entities? I don't know. I mean, I, I, I personally think the European project has proven that we are not a, a one-size-fits-all fit, culture. And when you create big government of any sort, you end up averaging things to a medium, like a, me, a, a medium, uh, standard, standardized idea of who you're serving and, and in that sort of scenario um, I mean we've seen it in Europe we need to have regional government because the world is not um, homogenous it is highly diverse and what what suits people in India isn't what's going to suit people in America and I don't think generally it's a good idea to enforce exactly the same standards on everybody so um, it, it's a tricky question. I'm, I'm not convinced that a world authority is the answer. Um, as to your question about how to redistribute the wealth, I'm a big, big supporter of UBI, um, universal big basic income. I think it's a really good idea. But um, I also think it, the, the solution is much simpler. Um, we could just get Facebook to pay its taxes, um, which they don't. Because they're these multinational corporations, they have extremely complex structures and they orientate towards the jurisdictions where they pay the least tax and tax is the best re i mean tax the government itself is the core insurance redistribution agency in the in in our society that's how we are supposed to redistribute wealth when when wealth concentrates too much here it's taxes that are supposed to balance um the 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 concentration so um, I think the biggest issue facing us is the um, continued um, um, availability of tax havens. I mean, for as long as there are going to be rogue jurisdictions that offer safe haven to corporations and tell them that if they domicile themselves in their, in their jurisdictions, they don't have to pay tax, we will have this problem whether we have UBI or not, because that fundamentally is what's undermining the redistribution of wealth. At the moment, I don't know if you've, if you if you get a chance to read it, there's a great new book by Gabriel Zuckman called The Hidden Wealth of Nations. And it's all about how, you know, the amount of wealth hidden in, in basically in tax havens. If you take all the world's assets and all the world's liabilities, they don't match. So we owe, there's like seven trillion that we owe someone. Ourselves. 
we owe ourselves, but it's not on the it's on it's not on the balance sheet. So he 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 speculates that it's the result of hidden wealth in tax havens. So I think that's quite interesting. So you don't think they can take it on themselves to redistribute directly <coughs> by they, passing the government? No, I don't think they could because what they wouldn't. I mean, not without a cent. Redistribution only works if we all have a say in that redistribution, right? So if you have a um, a corporation that is making redistribution um, decisions on our behalf, if it's doing it unilaterally, well, that's akin to tyranny, right? Because we don't have a say in how that redistribution occurs. So unless the redistribution occurs in a government structure, no? No, no, I'm, I'm, st I'm stopping. I'm just stopping it okay. because I don't, I don't want to We can talk on. about it afterwards. Yeah, we're, we're going to go to the pub, so if you want to have more questions, um, we can ask them there. Don't forget the meeting if you're in the MFA for year one and year two. Just, all right, everybody who's completing this year, there's a meeting in the seminar room in the Bats now. Uh, let's thank Isabella for thank a you. lot of work this evening. Thank no, you. Thank you for listening to me.